Hello everyone, this is Christopher Calandra. Welcome to our 2021 Investor Outlook presentation. Just a few kind of ground rules as we begin. Uh, everyone is muted, but if you have questions, use the chat feature. I want to be respectful of everyone's time, but uh, I imagine time will allow. If you want to post some questions, I'll do my best to cover them. If I'm not able to cover them, given our time constraints, I will follow up with you or the office will follow up with you uh, in regards to your questions after the fact. But hopefully we'll be able to get to some of them uh, today. I think that's all the ground rules I have. Today's agenda is uh, pretty straightforward. I want to share with you a review of the economy and the stock market and discuss our 2021 outlook for investors. Before we begin, and I typically do this during webinars that I conduct during any given year, it's always important to review that there are five key areas of financial planning. They are preservation planning, retirement planning, tax planning, estate planning, and investment planning. And we're a comprehensive financial services firm. So we always consider the impact of any recommendation that we make, any decision that is being considered, we want to base that on not just one, but all of these areas for our clients. So today's presentation is going to be mostly focused on the economy, the stock market and investment planning, but I don't want us to lose sight of the work that my team and I do day in and day out covering all five of these areas of financial planning. So let's take a quick look at uh, 2020. The U.S. stock market ended uh, at all-time highs and the uh, positive run has continued so far in the early going of 2021. Of course, 2020 was just an unbelievably difficult, wild, and unprecedented year because of lots of reasons. But what we saw was March of 2020 experienced the quickest downward decline in the stock market that we saw in a century. What we also saw beginning in the spring was a strong recovery that continues uh, up until today at least. It was fueled by a couple of things. It was fueled by the largest federal government stimulus ever. It was also fueled by historic support from the Federal Reserve. And it was aided by optimism about how quickly the U.S. economy would be able to bounce back uh, despite the pandemic and the economic shutdowns. This optimistic thesis has remained intact and I think it's going to be a factor in 2021 as well. I think it's pretty remarkable that we had this downturn, we had this pandemic, these unprecedented economic restrictions and shutdowns and that the market, the U.S. economy, was able to absorb all of this and still be able to prosper. It's, it's really a great success story for the U.S. economy and the markets. Federal Reserve, let's talk a little bit about that, because interest rates were not much help for investors in 2020. And we begin 2021 with interest rates at or near historic lows. Uh, the Federal Reserve chairperson is uh, Jay Powell, and he announced again in uh, December, December 2020, in the meeting that the Federal Reserve had, he reiterated that interest rates will stay close to zero for the foreseeable future. The Federal Reserve is on record pledging to keep interest rates low through 2023. I would take their guidance at face value. Of course, that could change, but I think expectations for interest rates going up should be very muted. Uh, expectations should be that interest rates are going to stay at these very low levels 
for quite a while, probably through 2023, as I mentioned a moment ago. I also want to say that Congress has acted very aggressively. They approved $3.5 trillion in emergency relief and stimulus in 2020. Uh, to put that in perspective, this was the largest action in the face of a recession that the U.S. has ever done. It was one of the biggest aid packages in the world. Going back to interest rates, you can see from the chart that interest rates on your average bank money market in this country is 0.09%, and the average one-year CD is 0.16%, just incredibly low. That means a million dollars in uh, allocated to a bank money market on average would earn nine hundred dollars over the course of a year. It's just it's just crazy low. It's hard to believe, and it's hard to believe that that's going to stay with us a while. But I believe that is the case. It also means these low rates become a challenge when investors are seeking income, which is very common for retired investors or investors that are approaching retirement to position assets so that they could generate income, this of course becomes much more difficult when you're in a 0% interest rate environment. And that's something that we here at Elliott Wealth Management and our clients uh, try and cope with to find new solutions and be creative to meet the needs of of clients seeking income in this 0%, 0% interest rate environment. It, it seems to me that one of the puzzling things about what occurred in 2020, and there are many, but one of them is the puzzling disconnect between what the stock market is doing and what the economy is doing. And what I mean by that is that the economy has recovered some compared to the lows we experienced in the first quarter of 2020. Uh, but the recovery has been a little fits and starts. Um, there's been some good news and some bad news. So we're experiencing an economic recovery, but it's not perfect. But when you contrast that with the recovery of the stock market, the recovery of the stock market has way outpaced the recovery in the economy and has raced ahead in its optimism. I'll also add, although it's not on the slide, it also is puzzling how much of a disconnect there is between the stock market and Main Street America. I have been in uh, this industry for 29 years. I became a financial advisor after graduating from a college in 1992, and I have never seen such a disconnect between what Wall Street is thinking about and how it's acting and what you see on Main Street America. Uh, it really is a crazy turn of events, and I'm not sure. I think a good question is how long can there be a disconnect before things start to come in better alignment? Uh, but so far, this disconnect has stayed with us for um, many months, and I'm not sure how that's going to change, but it's something that I think an awful lot about. This market rebound reflects that Wall Street is really optimistic about the prospects for 2021, but it also, as I just mentioned, accentuates the disconnect between the stock market's wild success and the fact that so many American households and small businesses are struggling. Uh, I think it's great that Wall Street is at all-time highs. Um, I'm pleased about that. And when I see how clients' portfolios have prospered the second half of 2020 and are off to a good start so far in 2021, I, I think that's great. But I, I also recognize that there are many places in this country as well as throughout the world, that are still experiencing shutdowns and economic restrictions, uh, dealing with high unemployment, uh, high hospital rates, dealing with economic hardships, not to mention many people feeling isolated and having trouble with the lack of uh, socialization. 
I think it's sad that many local businesses, including many in, in my town and surrounding towns here in Connecticut, uh, are struggling. Uh, businesses like restaurants, gyms, and small shops, uh, some of them are not open. Many will never recover. Some will never reopen. And the damage being done to those business owners, their employees, as well as the other businesses that provide services to those businesses, even if the pandemic magically went away today, uh, lots of those people have a long road to recovery. And uh, it's, it's kind of a sad state of affairs. Many Americans have done really well through this, uh, but some people are definitely being left behind. And I don't know if the stock market has necessarily grappled with this real life situation with so many people being battered by the pandemic and the shutdowns. Uh, COVID-19, as we move into 2021, is still in charge of this recovery path the economy is on. Everywhere you turn, we're reminded that there's a deadly pandemic that we're struggling to wrestle under control. If you go into public, you wear masks. Uh, our lives every single day in many, many ways has changed and continues to be impa impacted. Uh, the way we do business, the way we shop, the way we socialize, uh, it's, it's impacted, impacting our lives every day. This pandemic has been responsible for over 350,000 American deaths. And on the economic front, it's left millions of Americans uh, jobless and or underemployed. Uh, as we come into 2021, the statistics around COVID are changing, but we still have an alarmingly high case of daily rates of positivity. Uh, people are still dying each day. Hospitalizations in certain parts of the country are still peaking, although I will say in Connecticut, where I live, and uh, Elliot's main office is, well, we've seen hospitalization come down over the last couple of weeks, and the numbers are in Connecticut trending downward, which is very encouraging. But I also know that uh, the numbers in Connecticut were the envy of the country in the summer when we had an incredibly low rates of positivity, deaths, and hospitalizations. I think, for example, most of the summer in Connecticut, uh, hospitalization was 50. 50 people were in the hospital with COVID. Now, clearly, I feel badly for those 50 people. I would want that to be zero. Uh, but that is not a very alarming number. So the summer was great. But what we saw in the fall and into the early part of this winter uh, the numbers uh, trended up in a striking way, and it's great that the curve is bent downward again, but it's unclear what the future holds. Does the trend continue and flatten out, or do we see another spike a little bit down the line? So as we begin to talk about our outlook for 2021, our mantra for this year is to proceed with caution. Uh, I have... Uh, uh, looking at the, the list, the long list of, of people who've joined me on today's webinar, uh, many are clients that have been with me for quite a while. And you may be reminded that I've used this mantra before. Um, years ago, it was a mantra that we, we used. And uh, we, we brought it back again uh, because this year seems to be a year where we want to proceed with caution. And that's something that's going to be a watchword for us here as we think things through for 2021 and beyond. Our goal is to make sure that uh, the investment plan, the financial plan that we have for clients is centered on each individual or family's personal goals and their timelines. Uh, but again, caution is still the principal notion for investors this year. Uh, I want to talk a little bit now about causes for optimism, of which there are many. Uh, these are some of the key ones I wanted to discuss with you here today. Uh, I touched upon this a bit a few slides ago, but all indications are that the economy is in the early stages of a strong recovery. The thesis for the stock market has been that this recovery 
that's taking shape will be strong and powerful and it will be sustained. And that thesis has not changed for many months now. And as long as the economy is moving in the right direction, and it doesn't have to move in that right direction very fast, but as long as it at least is plodding along, I think that thesis for a strong recovery that's powerful and sustainable uh, will continue to help the markets. One element of this is the concept of pent-up demand in the economy. So if uh, all of you listening today are like people I've spoken to over these last many months, most people have things that they want to do when the coast is clear. Now I recognize the coast is clear will be different uh, for different people in different parts of the country, but most people have things that they want to do when the coast is clear. And almost all of that list of things to do will create economic, uh, economic activity uh, that will be unleashed when the coast is clear. And I think that uh, this pent-up demand proposition is also helping the market look beyond today's pandemic numbers and looking beyond today's healthcare crisis and thinking about when this pent-up demand gets unleashed it's going to do wonders for the economy. I'll add that I think some of this pent-up demand is also going to be some price insensitivity. So people are anxious to go back to traveling. Business people want to go see their employees, their coworkers, friends and family. They want a vacation. They want to go to ball games, concerts. They want to go to the theater. They want to go do the tourist thing in big cities. There's a lot people want to do, and they're going to be anxious to spend money to do these things. Uh, I mentioned a second ago that I think they'll be price insensitive. I think in a lot of instances, people will say, well, you know, I used to go see my family in a faraway state for a week, but now I'm going to go for 10 days. Or I want to go to a ball game, but I'm going to get better seats. I used to go see a Broadway play uh, once a year, but I'm going to go twice. People want to make up for what they missed out on, and there'll be some price insensitivity, which I also think will help with the economic recovery and create some terrific economic activity. So that's another reason for optimism. Of course, the vaccine, it's on its way. Uh, it's being rolled out. I saw a statistic that said that more Americans have already been vac uh, vaccinated than had contracted the COVID virus in the first place. If you read the news reports, the rollout is messy. It will be messy. This is an enormous undertaking. There is an unbelievable amount of logistics involved in this. And uh, the Biden administration, like the Trump administration before it, will take some criticism about the rollout. It's going to be messy. The market, though, the economy, though, is focused on, are we going to get a rollout? Will Americans get vaccinated? And when that happens, will we be better off? And I think the answer is yes, even if there are some missteps along the way. Uh, additionally, it's worth noting that U.S. businesses, and I think this is something that I wish, my personal wish, has got more attention in the media and just the public discourse, is uh, the U.S. economic system is amazing. It's very dynamic. It's very strong. And the ability of U.S. businesses to adapt to the new environment in 2020 is very impressive. On a dime, businesses figured out how they needed to change to protect their employees, to serve their customers, to leverage technology. Uh, and they did this not flawlessly, but they did it fast enough, effective enough, so that the economy, although it cratered in the first quarter, was able to rebound in a very strong way and sets the U.S. economy up for continued success. This ability for businesses to adapt and evolve and take advantage of new opportunities in this new environment is continued reason for optimism. This part, the strength of the U.S. economy has been with us probably since the founding of the country, but I think it represents that in 2020, despite 
lots of problems the country has and challenges that it has to overcome, it's still an economy that is the envy of the world in many, many ways. So that in and of itself is cause for optimism. Next, I wanted to follow up on what I already touched on. The federal government and the Federal Reserve has put a lot of money into the hands of Americans. What the uh, U.S. government has done, inclusive of the Federal Reserve, makes the relief efforts of the Great Recession back in 2008, 2009, seem like that was setting up a lemonade stand on a street with some 12-year-olds. I mean, the government has thrown so much money at this problem. There's a lot of money sloshing around in the hands of Americans. I mentioned how many Americans are struggling and hurt by this, and I'm sensitive to that. But I also recognize that many Americans have come through this okay financially. Uh, they did not lose their jobs. Their incomes were not hurt. Their prospect for their careers and their financial fortunes are at least as strong, if not stronger, than it was a year ago. And some of this has been helped by this money that's been put out on the street. As I said, there's a lot of money sloshing around. And the federal government and the Federal Reserve, I think, get credit. Yes, that means the Trump administration gets some credit uh, because they reacted to this pandemic in a very strong way. And this money that they put in the system, I think, contributed to this economic rebound that has also helped the stock market. Now, some of you might be listening to this and thinking about, okay, there might be negative ramifications to this down the line in terms of the debt and in terms of the uh, U.S. budget. And I admit that that is a concern down the line, but we were in a significant crisis, the likes of which we had never seen in our lifetimes, and it required an extraordinary, extraordinary effort. And we'll deal with later later, but I think the government deserves credit for acting decisively in a big way to help out the American people as well as the American economic system last year. Uh, and I think that's cause for optimism because the government and the Federal Reserve is willing to do things, including things that have never been done before, to help us get through this nasty episode with the pandemic. The Federal Reserve is very accommodating. Uh, you could read that as keeping rates low. Uh, it's accepted in economics that low rates spurs economic activity. Uh, it's very inexpensive for businesses to borrow money to get through this difficult period and maybe even borrow money to expand operations and take advantage of new opportunities. It's inexpensive for people to borrow uh, for homes. I think that's part of the reason why you've seen real estate, residential real estate values in most parts of the U.S. have done well through this. Part of that is these extraordinarily low borrowing rates. And last on my list is the opportunity for the new administration, Joe Biden's administration. Uh, they have an advantage. They're not burdened by the mistakes or the perceived mistakes of the previous administration. They get a fresh start. And uh, the Biden administration including uh, Joe Biden himself, plus who he surrounds himself with, they're going to want to make their mark uh, in the early going of the administration. And it is cause for optimism that they will, by not being burdened by the past, be able to help with the pandemic and help with this burgeoning economic recovery. There is cause for optimism with Joe Biden's administration. So all that sounds pretty good, uh, and I believe what I said is cause for optimism, but it's not like we don't have lots of things to worry about and things that keep me up at night and things that we want to monitor this year and beyond to make sure that the reasons to be optimistic are fulfilled. These reasons to worry are certainly things that could mess stuff up. Uh, number one is the pandemic is still not under control. Now, this varies depending on where you are, where you're listening to this. So I know, for example, um, on the call uh, is Larry, who's in California, and he's in the L.A. area. 
uh, California is experiencing a much worse version of the pandemic and economic shutdowns than other parts of the country. You know, Florida, northern Florida, where the second Elliott Wealth Management uh, office is, uh, is experiencing fairly tame COVID numbers at this point. Southern Florida, like Miami-Dade County, it's far worse. So the pandemic's not under control, although it depends a little bit about uh, depends a little bit on where you are. But it's certainly nationwide still not under control. It seems to me that uh, the federal government and state and local governments still don't have a clear idea on what they ought to do balancing out the need for safety on the healthcare front and imposing some restrictions in contrast with not wanting to snuff out the economy. And I think about Connecticut as an example. Recently, Governor Lamont, who I think on balance, in my opinion, has done a pretty good job throughout the pandemic. Connecticut's a small state sandwiched between two larger and more powerful economic uh, states, that being Massachusetts and New York. I think he's done a pretty good job, but recently he had uh, pre, well, let me state this way. Previously, he had said restaurants can be open beyond 10 o'clock. And I think personally that seems kind of arbitrary. I'm not sure why it's less safe after 10 than before 10. Uh, but now he recently, because the numbers in Connecticut have improved, he recently gave restaurants a little bit of a reprieve and they opened from 10 to 11. So here's my point. I don't know if there's any scientific information that says that 11 is better than 10. I don't think you could spreadsheet that or provide any data whatsoever. I think he's doing the best he can to try and make a decision. He has the burden of leadership and he's dealing with difficult decision making. But I use that as an example. I'm not sure what Gover Governor Lamont knows how whether that makes sense or if it doesn't make sense. And if uh, positivity rates begin to increase again, will it be, be because restaurants went from 10 to 11? I mostly shrug my shoulders. I, I don't think he knows. I don't know. I don't think anybody really knows. So our leaders are really struggling to get this under control and trying to figure out how to negotiate through this. Even though we're almost a year into it, I still think they're largely making it up as they go along, and that's a reason that makes me a little worried. Uh, I touched upon this already, but there's been tremendous damage to certain parts of the economy. Local businesses, Main Street, Americans, uh, in certain industries, in certain parts of the country have gotten battered by this. And as I already stated, even if the pandemic magically goes away today, their economic fortunes, their incomes, their um, financial outlook is not going to recover quickly in many instances. And I question whether the government, the markets, have really grappled with all of these people that are um, being left behind or not catching up as quickly as um, most of the rest of the country is. I think also that this economic recovery, this whole stock market rally, is predicated on the notion that we're in a recovery and the recovery is going to be strong and it's going to be sustainable and will last a while. But that recovery can be derailed. Uh, could be derailed by any number of things. We could have a geopolitical event. Uh, we could have a worse than expected outcome with the pandemic. One of these variants of the virus um, could have set us back on the healthcare front, which could uh, upset the recovery thesis. Uh, the administration could make economic missteps. You know, their policy prescriptions, um, both legislatively and through the various um, a policy making that a White House can do without going through Congress, you know, they can make mistakes and they can upset the apple cart in terms of the recovery. So we have to watch very closely uh, to make sure that the recovery thesis stays intact. But there are any number of things that can derail the recovery, which would upset the economic recovery thesis.
I want to talk about stock market valuations next, which might be a dangerous subject because it's a little bit can be in the weeds some, but I said at an earlier slide that the U.S. economy has recovered, but the U.S. stock market has recovered at a much faster rate. And what you find now is that the stock market is at the higher edge of traditional stock market valuations. Uh, so market valuations change over time. And let me point out, I'm not talking about the Dow being at 30,500. It's not what I'm talking about because some people will say the, the Dow is high because it's at 30,500. I'm talking more about if you invest $100 today into the stock market, how much are you going to get in corporate earnings uh, over this year and the expectation for earnings in subsequent years? And that ratio between investment and earnings and expected earnings is very high from a historical perspective. Now, many of you know me pretty well. I'm a geek. I'm a finance geek and I'm also a history geek. And history is a good guide with this. Historically, these stretched market valuations cannot continue in perpetuity. Something will have to give. Now, there's a few things that can happen. It's possible that the economic recovery thesis plays out well and the economy and corporate earnings grow enough, increase robustly enough that you grow into a more normalized valuation. That's definitely possible. That's sort of what the market has been counting on over these many months, but it's not a sure thing. It's possible that the market has to come down to get valuations into a more normalized level. And that is certainly possible. Uh, we have had a very good run. The fourth quarter was stronger than the third quarter last year, and this year has already gotten off to a positive start. It's certainly possible that we have some type of correction that brings market valuations down because you bring down the price of uh, the, what you pay for stocks. And if you did that and the earnings remained constant, you would get more normalized valuations. It's also possible that maybe the stock market goes sort of on pause mode. You know, maybe doesn't grow much, maybe doesn't shrink much, but just marks time and allows the economy to recover and earnings to recover some more to get back to more normalized valuations, to get more into a, a, a safer historical range. There's also the possibility, which I do not dismiss, although I am a student of history, that maybe this time is different. Uh, so much in our lives are different with the pandemic and technology and all kinds of things, the, f uh, the pace of change in our life is incredibly fast. So maybe this time is different, and maybe using history as a guide might be a little misleading because of the pandemic being unusual, technology being so prevalent, the pace of change being so incredibly fast. Maybe this time is different, and these high stock market valuations can be justified and carried for longer than history would tell you. Again, I don't discount that completely, but what I want to say in terms of an area to worry, uh, that's something that I want to watch incredibly closely this year is this stock market valuation um, topic uh, because it seems like something we'll have to give at some point. It doesn't necessarily mean something bad has to give, but that's really a key thing that we're going to watch. It's something we always monitor, but it's, it's almost like the most important thing in figuring out how we want to deploy and invest money is factoring in the stock market valuation topic. And then lastly, the new administration. Uh, you may notice that it was cause for optimism, but it's also a reason to worry. The new administration comes in and are put on the job during this difficult pandemic and economic um, uh, economic shutdown. It's not shutdown, but you know what I mean. Where we, we're still dealing with restrictions. The economy is not acting, uh, acting normally, not because of economic reasons, but because of governmental restrictions. 
And there's reasons to worry. Can the administration um, make enough good calls to help the economy and help the market carry out this recovery thesis? Uh, as I said before, there's reasons to be optimistic. Uh, but there's reasons to be pessimistic. One of the things that I worry about in the administration, it, and this is a personal opinion, and I know politically looking at the list of attendees, uh, I, um, well, let me take a step back. I love the fact that in my clients, people that I deal with, that they're from all different walks of life, different ages, different viewpoints, and they run the spectrum politically. I have lots of clients that I've worked with for a very long time that are very conservative, some that are very liberal, some that are in between. Uh, so my opinion about President Biden's administration, one of the things that worries me is the risk of a knee-jerk reaction that anything President Trump did needs to be overturned. And I'm not saying there aren't things that can be improved on, but it seems to me in the early going, I think he signed 43 executive orders already. And that breaks the record. I, I think like President Obama did four or five and President Trump did, you know, just a handful. I mean, he's broken the record in terms of that. And he won the election. He's entitled to do what he wants to do as president. I did said the same thing when President Trump entered into office. But my worry is the knee-jerk reaction that anything Trump did needs to be overturned. And that could potentially lead to trouble because not everything Donald Trump did while he was president, was bad or misguided. And the uh, supporters of President Biden, some of the more vocal elements of his party, kind of have just this, hey, shorthand, if Donald Trump liked it, I don't like it. If Donald Trump didn't like it, then I like it. And that shorthand could come back, back to bite the administration and cause some trouble with this economic recovery. So that's my personal opinion. You may disagree, but that's something that I want to watch. Talking a little bit more about the administration, and again, I know some of you were incredibly worried when President Biden was elected, and I know many of you were extremely excited that he was elected and that Donald Trump was not going to be in office for four more years. But let's look at the new administration. They are currently working on plans as we speak, negotiating with Congress. Uh, the Biden administration is negotiating with their own party, their own leadership in Congress, as well as uh, entertaining bipartisan buy-in from uh, the Republicans. But I think it's likely we're going to get more stimulus. How much, the shape, I mean, that still has to get hammered out. Uh, the market likes this. I think we could debate the wisdom of putting more money out on the street and what might come later on in terms of the negative consequence of this. Um, you know, if they called and asked me, I would prefer to see more targeted stimulus. What they've done thus far, and it made complete sense in 2020, is very little underwriting. They just put money out on the street. And we all know examples of people that got extra unemployment that was sort of ridiculous. You know, the person that was working and uh, making a small amount of money and were getting state unemployment for $100, and then all of a sudden they got $700 because the federal government added $600 to the tally. And now they were making more money than they did when they were working. Yes, there are stories about that. Yes, it's true, and it is a sign of government in inefficiency. But what the government needed to do last year was get money out fast. And you can't get money out fast and also be very diligent in the underwriting of who gets what. And I think they made the better decision, although I don't like to see and hear those stories. And uh, let me be fair. There's also lots of stories about PPP loans, businesses getting PPP loans that will be forgiven from the U.S. government that were not necessarily harmed or under great threat from the pandemic, but they were able to get the PPP loans because that's the way the government had set it up. Uh, so they were not targeted in 2020, and that makes sense. I question the wisdom of doing stimulus now in an untargeted way in 2021, when there are clearly winners and losers, people that are struggling and businesses that are struggling mightily, 
and ones that are not. I'm not sure if that'll come through in the stimulus package because to get all politicians to kind of buy in, it's easier to just do it for everybody than for them to be making difficult decisions on this group gets it and this group doesn't get it. But we're likely to get stimulus, and regardless of my personal opinions, I think it's very, very clear the stock market likes this. For better or worse, the stock market likes this, and the market will react favorably to any stimulus that comes down the pike this year, and I think it's incredibly likely we're going to get stimulus. Tax increase. Uh, President Biden, on the campaign trail, talked about uh, tax increases and undoing the tax legislation that was passed in President Trump's first year in office back in 2017. Uh, that legislation reduced rates, expanded brackets, uh, reduced corporate tax rates as well as personal tax rates. Uh, it's a little unclear as to if he would be in favor of getting rid of the entirety of that tax law or if he would target certain aspects of it, such as the corporate tax rate, it's very unclear. My personal opinion, uh, my current thinking on this, is that is not something that President Biden will try and get done in 2021. I think he has his hands full. I think there'll be other initiatives that he'll try and get done legislatively. I think that might be more of a topic of discussion in 2022 or maybe even 2023. So some of my clients, as I've spoken with people since the election, are very fearful that tax rates are going to go up uh, dramatically in the term. I don't see it that way. It might be possible. It might be that President Biden and his administration would like to do that. I just don't think they're going to be able to get to it that quickly. We'll have to see how it plays out. Uh, we did a webinar back in October about the election, providing a historical perspective. And um, one of the things that I learned in the preparation for that webinar is that uh, in the recent past, a new administration usually gets one signature legislative accomplishment in their first two years. Uh, for President Trump, I already mentioned that was the tax law. Uh, prior to that, for President Obama, it was the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. So I think with the new administration, uh, what I want to watch is, is where is he going to seek a big legislative signature kind of victory? I don't know if it'll be the stimulus. Perhaps it's that, but I suspect he'll want to do something other than the stimulus and that will be his signature legislative accomplishment like the Affordable Care Act and the tax law that President Trump signed in the law. But I'm not sure where he's going to go. I just don't think it's going to be a tax increase. Uh, vaccine distribution, I already touched on this. Um, a, a, a politician when they're campaigning, you know, they, they say a lot of things. And when you get into office, you're not always able to do exactly what you said you were going to do, and it's not as easy as you might have claimed it would be on the campaign trail. All politicians do this. We've all been around. We all know that this is the case. Well, it was very easy on the campaign trail to say, we're going to do the vaccine rollout, and we're going to do this, that, and the other thing. Uh, and I think the administration will do a good job with the rollout. But as I've already said, it's likely to be messy. It's likely to be uneven. Some states are better prepared to do this kind of thing than others. There's been stories out of New York about New York City maybe fumbling their vaccine rollout and having to destroy lots of uh, vaccine doses because they weren't taken care of. You know, I think that stuff is going to take place. It's inevitable. But the new administration really needs to execute well on this vaccine rollout. It's part of what they campaigned on. Uh, it provides a nice contrast with the perception that the Trump administration bungled many things. We could debate whether they did or didn't, but lots and lots of Americans believe they did. And if President Biden could do a better than average job rolling out the vaccine, that'll do wonders for his administration, not to mention helping get the 
uh, health care crisis under control. And then the last with the new administration is trade agreements. You know, President Trump was very active and undid a lot of uh, what President Obama had done on this front. And now we're confronted with the likelihood that President Biden will undo a lot of what President Trump did. And it's almost like reverting back to what President Obama's worldview was in terms of trade agreements. Uh, but the world has changed since President Obama was in office. You know, a lot has changed over these years in this fast changing world we live in. So it's going to be interesting to see how trade agreements play out. We have the Paris um, Climate Accords. We have ongoing trade negotiations with China. Uh, there, there's a lot that will need to be addressed by the administration. They've only been in office a few weeks. I don't think there's really been much movement on this front, but that is definitely something that's important in terms of the outlook for the administration. Uh, I also want to point out, and again, we had talked about this a bit in the 2020 October uh, webinar that focused on the election, is that there have been 10 instances, we did, we did some research on this, there's been 10 instances where the Democrats controlled both the House, the Senate, and the White House since World War II. And that's where we find ourselves. You probably know the uh, uh, Democrats, uh, of course, are in the White House. They have control of the House and the Senate, although the margins are slim. Uh, the Senate's 50-50, 50 senators, 50 uh, Republican senators, 50 Democratic senators, which means the Democrats control because Vice President Harris would cast a tie-breaking vote. But when you look at the 10 instances since World War II, eight of the 10 times uh, we had the stock market uh, performing well. In fact, uh, seven of the eight instances you saw the market in the first two years actually have double-digit returns on the Dow. There was one instance, 61-62, under President Kennedy, where the market had a more muted plus 8%. But listen, I wouldn't be disappointed with plus 8%. Um, that'd be okay. Uh, I would much prefer plus 33, like we saw in 63, 64, but plus 8 would not be a big problem. Uh, there were two instances, like I said, uh, 65, 66, where the, the Dow went down 10%, and under President Jimmy Carter in 77, 78. So if you're playing the odds... Um, the market should do just fine. And if, if you're very alarmed with the election of President Biden, hopefully this gives you some cause for optimism that the sky will not fall now that we have President Biden in office. Although that negative 18 from President Carter is a pretty ugly number. But I thought this would provide some valuable uh, insight historically to what we might be able to draw from, at least historically. Again, this time is different. Uh, we live in a different world than we did in the 60s, of course, but I, I think it's an interesting bit of data. So what are analysts forecasting for uh, 2021? The stock market enters with a favorable outlook. Um, Barron's, the very influential financial publication, recently surveyed 10 market strategists and chief investment officers at large banks and money management firms on their outlook for 21. And the average was for a total return of around 10 or 11% for the U.S. stock market. Uh, the panel also predicted that the U.S. economy will grow by 5% in 2021. Now, why is 5% important? Because if we achieve that in 2021, and again, that's an if, it would be the fastest rate of GDP growth since 1984. The U.S. economy has had a difficult time growing at that fast of a clip in a long time. Uh, now, I know President Trump campaigned on the idea that he could get the economy growing faster than President Obama did. And he thought that he would be achieved uh, four or five percent GDP growth, and although he was partially successful, he had a U.S. economy that grew faster than it did under President Obama. We could debate how much was his doing and how much was 
other factors. But the U.S. economy did grow up until the pandemic struck at a pretty good clip, better than under, uh, better than during President Obama's eight years in office. But he was partially successful. He did not get to 5%, or the economy under his watch did not get to 5%. It'd be remarkable if the U.S. economy could get to 5%, given that we haven't done that since 1984. I think this speaks to some of that strong optimism that I've referenced several times already during today's presentation. Uh, that would be a very healthy year. Uh, so this forecast is very optimistic. Uh, I want to remind you that we uh, want to factor in your thoughts about risk and focus on your financial situation when we make recommendations. But I think this analyst's outlook for 2021 is important because it's another highlighting of this economic recovery thesis that took hold last year and is still intact um, today. As I said, uh, the vaccine rollout is another way that this optimism can be realized as being legitimate. We want to have a good rollout of the vaccine, be as, um, uh, have a, as little mess and missteps as possible, um, but that's the key thing is the vaccine because as I mentioned already, COVID-19 is a central figure for investors in 2021. I mean, and it probably is for all of our lives, right? I mean, it's ever-present in our lives. So the outlook for 2021, lots of uncertainty. Uh, I want to just, as we begin to wrap up, some key takeaways. I feel, and I don't know if, if you share my thoughts on this, but I feel like this year is an incredibly important year for the country. Not just the economy and the markets, which, of course, is important, given my profession. Uh, but I just think politically, as a society, as we um, treat each other as citizens, I, I just think it's an incredibly important and pivotal year. Uh, and what we talked about narrowly focusing on the economy and the markets is representative of this larger uh, importance for this year. Um, I think another key takeaway is this disconnect. Because when you see the news tonight, uh, when you read the newspaper, when you think about how your life has been changed and interrupted, not being able to see loved ones, maybe not being able to go to your office, not being able to travel, having to wear masks, having to be worried about being close to people, not being able to hug people. Um, and then you look at what the stock market does, and the stock market behaves in a way that is weird against the backdrop of what I just described. Um, another key takeaway is that the COVID-19, uh, the pandemic, the health crisis, the economic shutdowns, the success of the vaccine rollout is absolutely critical to investors. And caution and vigilance this year are critical. We want to proceed with caution. And I've mentioned this already a couple of times, but what we want to focus on is not just the macro story that we talked about today, but the achievement of your own personal goals and objectives. Uh, so please uh, call us with any concerns you have, any questions you have. Um, we are here to be a resource for you. Uh, what you can expect from us is uh, the same as it's been. Uh, we want to review regularly changes that may affect you. For example, if we get major tax legislation, that's something that we will um, look at and study very closely. We want to have regular communication with all of you. Uh, that includes webinar, the Simply Financial podcast, monthly mailings, um, strategy review meetings, uh, all of the different ways we could uh, connect to hopefully help you win with money and achieve your financial goals. Uh, we expect we're going to have more frequent discussions with uh, many people given the wide variety of changes and uncertainties that we're dealing with. And we're ready for that in 2021. In fact, we look forward to it. Uh, we're going to continue to review what's happening on the economic side of things, but also what's happening taxes with uh, estate planning and uh, investment issues for our clients. Um, if you know of anyone 
which uh, might benefit from a fresh perspective given all the change and tumult of 2021, please keep us in mind. We would welcome introductions that make sense, again, for folks that might be looking for a uh, fresh perspective from us. Uh, your health and your well-being is our highest priority. Um, I appreciate the entire team here at Elliott Wealth Management appreciates the opportunity to help you with your financial needs, and we look forward to long-term successful business relationships as we uh, plan for your success together. So thank you so much for listening. I went a little long, um, and I, I want to wrap this up at the one-hour mark, but I did have some questions about sort of the topic du jour. We had a market event related to several stocks, particularly GameStop and AMC, the theater chain. And, you know, real quickly, and I could probably spend hours talking about this because I find it fascinating. But to suffice to say, this is a narrowly uh, tailored event that was for these particular stocks. It was not an economic event. It wasn't even really a market event. It was something specifically going on with these stocks. And it was a speculative event revolving these stocks, which I don't think for most of us with our planning really impacts what we want to do today, tomorrow, or next week. If you happen to have owned gain stock and made a lot of money, that's great. If you happen to have bought it at the high, it's down 70% the last two days, well, then you, your speculative bet did not work out. But what you had is the big boys, the hedge funds, they shorted these stocks heavily. Shorted meaning they took positions that would uh, increase in value if the stock price went down. But they shorted a lot of the stock. So like GameStop, they had shorted 140% of the shares. So they were heavily weighted into this trade. And so some um, investors using new platforms and social media forums like Reddit and Robinhood on the trading platform side, you know, started buying into the stocks and got the stock prices to go up. And then what ends up happening is, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but if you're a short seller, you have to go buy stock to cover your shorts. But there wasn't because they were 140% into the stock on the um, short side of things, there wasn't enough stock to go around. So you had buyers via the Reddit community buying stock, bidding up the prices. Then you had short sellers who wanted to cover their positions, also wanted to buy shares. Well, there were too few shares to go around. And what do you have when you have supply and demand interruptions? If you have short supply and a lot of demand, it drives up prices. And that's what we had. We had a speculative explosion in prices because you had a shortage of shares available. Once that's relieved, eventually GameStop is likely to return back to something more similar to what it's worth economically, which is much closer to the very low price it was trading at well before this. Everything else in between is a speculative game of chicken, and there's a lot of smart money. There's a lot of dumb money. It's a crazy situation. I'm not involved in it. I don't really want to be involved in it. Uh, but that's my quick answer on that. So we are at the one-hour mark. I want to thank everyone for joining me today. I appreciate you spending a few minutes with me. I hope you found the information valuable. We will post this on the Elliott Wealth site. That's www.elliottwealth. So if you want to revisit any of this, it's available on the website, or you could contact us and we could email it to you, and feel free to share it if there's anybody you think would like to um, listen to this and check it out. I hope you all have a very safe and healthy 2021, and I also hope we also have a lot of happiness and joy in 2021. Thanks again. I'll talk to you all very soon.